بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين المصطفى أبي القاسم محمد الله صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل جمع وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فوجه أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وقرآنه الحميد وقوله الحق أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ثم أتبع سببا حتى إذا بلغ بين السدين وجد من دونهما قوما لا يكادون يفقهون قولا قالوا يا ذا القرنين إن يأجوج ومأجوج مفسدون في الأرض فهل نجعل لك خرجا على أن تجعل بيننا وبينهم سدا قال ما مكنني فيه ربي خير فأعينوني بقوة أجعل بينكم وبينهم ردما آتوني زبر الحديد حتى إذا ساوى بين الصدفين قال فخوا حتى إذا جعله نارا قال آتوني أفرغ عليه قطرا فما استطاعوا أن يظهروا وما استطاعوا له نقبا قال هذا رحمة من ربي فإذا جاء وعد ربي جعله دكاء وكان وعد ربي حقا صدق الله العلي العظيم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وآل محمد my dear brothers and my dear sisters, continuing with our discussion about the story of Dil Qarnayn. Last night, we discussed his third journey. We said that his first journey was somewhere to the west. Then he came back from there all the way to the east. And somewhere he came back to somewhere in the middle. That place he arrived at in the middle, he found a group of people, a community out there, whom he had some difficulty communicating with, but somehow they managed to communicate and talk. Apparently this group was not so primitive in their living. Apparently they had some, some kind of a financial system. Because they told him that we have a problem, if you help us overcome it, we're willing to pay you for it. So they're kind of aware of some kind of an exchange, a trade of some sort. However, they still were unable to deal with the problem that they were, that they were facing and this was a problem of security. There was another group who continued to raid them on a regular basis and because of that, it created a lot of instability in their lives. And hence they asked the Qarnayn for help. Not only that, apparently these people also recognized the Qarnayn. Qalu ya al Qarnayn. You know, apparently when they saw his army, when they saw him, somehow they recognized that he is able to help them. Unlike the second group, for example, that he visited, Apparently they did not really recognize the Qarnayn. These guys apparently they had some sort, maybe they heard about him somewhere. You know, somehow. They knew that he was able to help them, so he did. And indeed he built them this well-made wall that prevented their opponents, their enemies from coming to them and raiding them. So he managed to establish peace, security for this nation. 
upon seeing that it was a great wall and it did the job when those opponents when the enemies came they could not cross it he became humbled as opposed to arrogant and he said Hada rahmatun mir rabbi. this is of the mercy of my Lord in other words I did not do it all on my own so all of all of Allah's rahmah not only this he was a good king they told him we'll pay you to do this for us he said I don't need your money whatever Allah has given me is much better than what you guys can offer me so he did not need any money and indeed if a man knows where to find iron and gold and silver and you know copper etc if he can find all this then what would he need with people's you know offerings in addition to this whatever my Lord has given me Allah says we enabled him on this land and what else we gave him we gave him of the means of everything so he doesn't need anything alhamdulillah Allah has given him the best of whatever he wants in dunya and inshallah in akhirah here is an important point though that is mentioned here this group of people the third group cites a very eminent problem and that is the lack of security there is no security and because of the lack of security it's hindering our progress because every time we build something we develop something those enemies come they raid it all they destroy it and they go back then you have to spend the time rebuilding making it over again and you're still worried they're gonna come back again and they'll destroy it all again then you have to rebuild again and not only that now you're worried you're living in fear will they come back again at us when are they coming back etc etc imagine living in that kind of a life where you're constantly worried because of that it will hinder your progress there is a famous American psychologist by the name of Abraham Maslow in 1943 he published a paper a theory of human motivation was the title of his paper in which he gave prerequisites requirements in order for people to become successful interestingly Maslow unlike many psychiatrists or psychologists he studied healthy people Freud for example who's another famous psychologist or psychiatrist Sigmund Freud based his theories on his patients the patients that he used to have he used to examine them treat them and later on he formulated his theories so he was studying patients Maslow interestingly said if you study people who are not healthy then your theories themselves are not going to be healthy that's that was his idea when it comes to psychology he says you need to study healthy people so you can really develop healthy conclusions but that was his you know kind of philosophy so he actually studied people like Albert Einstein what makes Einstein and Einstein why can't everybody become an Albert Einstein how come so he developed a theory that became known as Maslow's theory of motivation that what motivates people to work and that's what helps them to become successful that theory was then made into a pyramid and hence it became known as Maslow's pyramid where at the bottom of the pyramid are the most essential requirements and it goes up until you reach the pinnacle of the pyramid so what does he say 
He He gives four requirements in order for the person to achieve the fifth, which is the pinnacle. So there are five in total. The first he suggests is in order for a person to start becoming creative, to go on that path of development, motivation, the first thing you need are physiological needs. You need food. You need water. You need air. These are the basic needs that you have to provide every human with. And that's the first need. So what he calls the physiological needs. Your food, your water, etc. I mentioned a few nights ago, if you remember, there are parts in the world where people do not have clean water. And they have to walk literally every day five miles at least. In some cases, even ten miles each way just to go to a well from which they can fill out their buckets of water and walk five to ten miles back so that they can drink this water. If we are going to spend five to ten miles each way and then on the way back we have to carry this big jug or bucket of water on our head or on our back until you get back just so that you can have water. Is there time left for you to think? Is there time left for you to start becoming creative? I mean, your biggest worry is to keep yourself alive. So let alone becoming creative and how to become successful, etc. Forget all that. Your biggest problem is survival. You need to survive. And that's a major problem. That's why I mentioned a few nights ago, unfortunately, according to certain statistics, about one billion people in the world today are living in poverty. One billion, approximately. Which is a sad statistic. When we have, mashallah, so much wealth, and with all these billion of people dying, you have nations signing contracts of 450, 500 billion dollars of military. You know, sometimes I just wonder, you know, do we live in a logical world or a world of insanity? You know, brothers, uh, let me just give you an example. Here, you're walking by on the street, you see someone dying. Someone literally is dying in front of you because they don't have food. He's dying right there. And you leave him, it's like, you know, I need to buy my argila. My argila is more important than this guy, you know. So you go in and you buy an argila, you know. Although some people, I think, might do that, actually. You know, I'd be like, I'd prefer having my argila than giving him my money. But another example or a better example is you see that person dying, you go and you buy a gun instead. Do you think that's something a person with some sanity would do? He is dying on the street, literally. He needs that $5 of yours so that he can survive. And instead of giving him the $5, you go and you buy yourself a gun. Does that make any sense to you? If you see someone doing that, what do you call him? What do you call that person? I don't know. But that's what's happening in the world today. $450 billion to create jobs at the expense of 1 billion people who are dying in the world out there. I was driving the other day here in the city. In the city I was driving and I saw a billboard just a couple days ago. A big billboard. It said, why do one in six children in the USA have to struggle with hunger? One in six children in the United States have to struggle with hunger. And they're asking, why? Why is that the case? I mean, it'll be an interesting question. I don't know. I don't have an answer for it, to be honest with you. I don't know what the answer is. You know. But nonetheless, that's a problem. So physiological needs are the basic needs that one needs to provide. That's what he says. Second is what he calls security. You need security. You need to have a shelter, a house. You need to have what he calls also financial stability. You have, don't have to worry about your money. You don't have to worry about your food. 
I said, remember a couple nights ago, Alhamdulillah, we're so blessed living here. Alhamdulillah, that we are fasting. We don't even have to worry about iftar. It's not something that is of concern to us. There is always khair, walhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Whereas some people, some parts of the world, they have to worry. They have no iftar, nothing. They're fasting the whole day with nothing. So security is important. They need security. Or some parts of the world where there are, as we read in the papers and we see on television, bombings happening here, you know, uh, killings happening there. People at the time of this time of the year, I remember last year, same time, same time in one of those countries, people were shopping, preparing for their Eid in a mall at a shopping center in one of the Muslim countries. And unfortunately, an explosion happens that kills hundreds of people who were about to celebrate Eid. That celebration turned into a aza, a catastrophe, a problem for them. You know. So imagine living such a condition where you go outside, you don't know if you're going to come back alive. I mean, that's another blessing that we have, brothers and sisters. Alhamdulillah, you guys left your homes today, coming to the center, walhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. And you don't have to worry about security. Alhamdulillah, that's a big ni'mah. That's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, our Prophet says, ni'matan maghbunatan, as-sahhatu wal-aman. He says, two blessings are forgotten about. People forget about them, how, how great they are. Two, what are they? Health and security. You hear sometimes people in the holy month of Ramadan, Ya Allah, help me succeed in my exams. Ya Allah, help me, for example, increase in my rizq. Ya Allah, give me more money. Ya Allah, give me a big house. Ya Allah, give me a better job. And sometimes people forget, Ya Allah, keep me healthy. Which is a very important dua. But they take it for granted because we're always healthy. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. At least some people are. So people forget. But within a second, that health could be taken away from you. And then that's the biggest ni'mah Allah can give you. I remember one of the mu'mineen once told me that many years ago, many years ago in Iraq, many years ago, I mean maybe about many years ago, but 60, 60 or so years ago, he said that there was a, a person who owned a wood shop, you know, a, a wood. So he had a warehouse full of wood. He used to sell wood, okay, different kinds, different, you know how you go these days to these big, you know, depot stores? to buy wood. This guy had, you know, one of those stores to sell wood. They came to him one day and they told him that your warehouse is burning. It's caught on fire. He came and he started looking at the warehouse and he started like smiling, you know, like this. People thought this guy lost his mind, you know, that's it. I think he's just, well, us, you know, finished. It's just, and back in those days, there was no insurance, there was nothing. This is all your, your, your whole investment right in front of your eyes, burning right in front of your eyes, literally. So he said, people thought that this guy has gone crazy a little bit. But then, you know, upon, you know, somebody came to him, he said, are you okay? Everything is okay? I mean, you seem to be laughing at this, you know. He's like, well, I have two options. I either cry or I laugh, you know. So I'd rather laugh, you know. I mean, if I cry and I start, you know, shouting and weeping and crying, that's not going to bring my wood back, you know. It's gone, khalas. But, alhamdulillah, I still have my health. I still have my health. I still have my reputation as a businessman. I can, with my reputation, I can go, you know, maybe get some wood here and there and try to build again, try to work it again. I have my health, I have my reputation, I have those people who can help me out. So, alhamdulillah, you know, khalas. Great, great attitude to have. You know, this is what we call, you're looking at things, the cup is half full. That's what we call the positive attitude, which is extremely important in success. One of the criteria of success, to have a positive attitude, a positive outlook. One of the ways to have actually inner peace is to have a positive outlook at things. You always look at the cup half full. Look at always the plus sign, the positive. Never mind the negative. So that's something important. Security is extremely important. So according to mass law, first thing is physiological needs. Second is your security needs. Interestingly, before we move on to the next one, the Quran makes a reference to these in a different surah. 
Do you guys know Surat Quraysh? Quraysh? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Li'ilafi Quraysh. Ilafihim. Rahlatal. Shita'i wa sayf. Fal ya'budu. Alladhi. MashaAllah. Very good. MashaAllah. And then what are, what are the last two? At'amahum min ju'in. And when what? Wa amanahum min khawf. Which two blessings does Allah list upon Quraysh? He fed them from hunger and he protected, he blessed them with security. He protected them from fear. Quraysh had that blessing because they had the Kaaba. Mecca had the Kaaba. So usually travelers, caravans used to make Mecca what we call today like the pit stop. You know, people would stop in Mecca to do a pilgrimage. Remember I said that they had the remnants from the teachings of Ismail alayhi salam. So these guys had understanding. In fact, they used to do tawaf around the Kaaba, although they used to do it tawaf in a different way. They used to do sa'i between, you know, Safa and Marwa, but in a different way, in different style, in different manner. But nonetheless, they had these kind of remnants, you know, the leftovers of the teachings of Ibrahim and Ismail alayhi salam. So that Kaaba had some reverence. These people, when they used to come, Caravans used to stop in Mecca. Well, that's great for business. You know, that's what you call tourism. So you always had caravans coming in and out. So that's great. That drives economy. So Quraysh never had to worry about food. You always had business, trade. Second thing is, because of the reverence of the Kaaba, people would not attack Mecca. So Mecca was living at peace. Whereas in pre-Islamic Arabia, the attitude was, the minute my tribe becomes stronger than your tribe, guess what? We're raiding you guys, and we're stealing all your goods, and we're coming back. And not only that, we'll take you as slaves as well. You know, that was the attitude. So people lived in constant fears. That's why you would find tribes, mashallah, I don't have to worry about physiological needs, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, thank you. So, people were living in constant fear. That's why people used to have a lot of children, they wanted boys. Sometimes they would call their boys like some scary names, like, you know, Nimr, like Sakhar, you know, Rock, you know, and these names were still there. You know. And until now, we hear people naming the same names, Fahad, Asad, and so on and so forth, Lion, you know, Panther, Tiger, etc., etc. These names are still there. But those names were to scare the enemies, that, you know, we have boys, we have men to protect us. So that was something back in those days. Mecca? did not have to worry about it. Especially, especially after what happened to Abraha, the king who came to destroy the Kaaba and Allah destroyed him. Especially, you know, that which surah is that mentioned in? Surah Al-Fil, exactly, mashallah. Very well, very well, mashallah. You guys are smart people here tonight, man, alhamdulillah. Surah Al-Fil. It's like, you know, the other day, one, you know, it's just said one day a man came to pray behind. This is a true story, actually. It used to happen back in the old days. Uh, a man came to pray Salat al-Jama'ah behind one of the sheikhs, and the sheikh recited Surah al-Naml after Surah al-Fatiha. He recited Surah al-Naml. The next day, you know, Surah al-Naml is a bit of a longer surah, you know. So the next day, this, this man came to him and said, you know, Naml means ant, right, the ant. So the next day, this man comes to him and said, Sheikh, uh, tonight after Salat al yani in, in the Salat, after Surah al-Fatiha, which surah will you be reciting tonight? He said, tonight I'll be reciting the feel, insha'Allah, the elephant. The man says, if the ant was so long, how big is the field then? <laughs> You're going to be reciting the elephant? You know? So he ran away, not realizing that Surah Al-Fil is actually a small surah. But he was comparing sizes. Nonetheless, but uh, because of what happened, which is mentioned in Surah Al-Fil, the whole destruction of the attackers of the army of Abraha, people, their reverence and their respect for the Kaaba and for Mecca grew even bigger. They said, do not mess with Quraysh anymore. So Quraysh even enjoyed even greater protection. So these are the blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quran mentions them, food and security. These are important things. And that's why brothers and sisters, it's good always on a regular basis to thank Allah. Every day, if you can, after every wajib salat, every mandatory prayer, dhuhr, asr, maghrib, isha, fajr, just do sujood quickly, and at least say, alhamdulillah, 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 three times. 
three times, alhamdulillah. At least that is called the sujood of gratitude. Sajjatu shukr to Allah. Of course, it is also mustahab to say it a hundred times if you have time. To go to sujood and hundred times say shukran lillah, shukran lillah, shukran lillah. But if that you don't have time, at least three times. Shukran lillah, shukran lillah, shukran lillah. Or alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. It's good. It's good to read munajatu shakirin. Munajatu shakirin is a prayer taught by Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam. Try to learn these du'as. They're beautiful. They're good ways to start our days, to start our morning, to keep in touch with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those two things that he mentions. Okay, so first of all, physiological needs. Second, security. Third, he says people need love and belonging. They need to be loved. They need family. Family is important. The human being is a social being. He needs people. So therefore, another requirement in that ladder of mass law is the sense of belonging. You need to belong someone, somewhere. You need to be loved. You need to be taken care of. Family is important. That's the third one. And that's why, brothers and sisters, always keep the bond of family a strong bond. Look after it, especially this time of Eid is coming up, alhamdulillah. Look after your parents, look after your children, look after your families, look after your cousins. Keep that family bond there to the best of your ability. That's the third. The fourth that he suggests is what he calls esteem. What is esteem? He says people need to feel that they are respected. That's something important. So people need to feel that they are appreciated. That's how they develop self-esteem. And that's something important, according to him. That's according to him, that's something important, esteem. This is something where I beg to differ from him. Not to say I'm a psychologist, you know, so it's not really something for me fair to discuss about Abraham, who's, who's, who's a, a psychologist by profession. Where do I disagree about esteem? Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, sallamullahi alayhi, says, لا تستوحشوا طريق الحق لقلة سالكي. Do not feel strangers on the path of truth because there are so few people following it. If you see everyone doing something, but that thing is not the right thing. Well, I don't need people to approve of what I'm doing so that I can develop my esteem as long as what I'm doing is right, is the right thing. Let me give you an example. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib sallamullahi alayhi became the Khalifa after about 25 years, after the Prophet's death. So 25 years, there was a gap between him and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, until he became the Khalifa. Of course, he is Khalifatullah. Allah appointed him as a Khalifa. But we're talking about the Khilafah in terms of the political system out there, in the materialistic world. After 25 years, he came to power. People came to him. They said, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen. Mu'awiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, who is the ruler right now over Sham, he wants power. So why don't you give him power? You know what? Approve of him as the governor of Sham in the meantime. Wait. You just came to power. Don't rock the boat so quickly. Let him stay in power. Well, what else? Talha and Zubair, two important personalities, companions of the Prophet. They also want power. So why don't you give them some power? You know, make Talha governor of some place and make Zubair a governor of another place. You know, this way you start winning people's, you know, respect. You, wins, you win people's love. Once you become the Khalifa, I mean, one, I mean, he is already the Khalifa, but once your Khilafa gels, you know, solidifies, once you kind of establish yourself, you have the power, everything, then you can kick Muawiyah out, terminate him, get rid of him, because then you've already set yourself. Get rid of Talha, get rid of Zubair, and now you can start fighting corruption. What do you think of that strategy? Did Imam Ali approve of it? No, he didn't. He said, I'm sorry. That's not what I'm going to do. Muawiyah 
is a tyrant. He's oppressive. Talha and Zubair are not qualified to become leaders, governors. If I approve of their governorship now, if they oppress anyone who is responsible before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I will be. That's one. Second, if I approve of them now, come two, three years later, for example, I say, Muawiyah, get out. He'll tell me why. How come? Well, you're not unfit to become a, a governor. Well, why did you approve me for three years then? Three, three years, you know, four years, I've been approved as a governor. What's the problem? What happened now? What changed now? That would show a different color. Imam Ali alayhi salam is not a hypocrite, wal billah. God forbid. He's not a hypocrite. I remember, brothers and sisters, it is mentioned in Nahjul Balagha. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, Muawiyah is not smarter than I am in politics and war. However, he uses hypocrisy. I don't. I'm not a hypocrite. I'm a straight man. I fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He uses hypocrisy. To Muawiyah, the end justifies the mean. Cheat, lie, kill, do whatever it is, as long as you can get the power. Doesn't matter how. Imam Ali, that's not the way it works. You have to go on the Surat al mustaqim I remember a few years ago when I was in university, I was taking a class on Islam, Islamic studies. I had uh, the professor who was a, uh, a Christian man teaching Islamic studies at the university at the time. The professor one day in one of his lectures said, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib was a good leader. However, he was a weak politician. A weak politician. When I heard this, I raised my hand. I said, doctor, what's your definition of politician? How do you define a politician? Liar? If that's your definition of a politician, a liar, then yes, Imam Ali was the weakest politician. If that's your definition. However, if by a politician you mean a man who respects people, who respects humanity, who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who does not lie, does not cheat, does not betray, is not a hypocrite, then Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, was the best politician you could ever have in the world after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. What do you mean he's a weak politician? He said, well, you know, this, he, he gave this as one example. You know, they told him, why don't you keep Muawiyah, you keep you know, Talha, Zubair, whatever, keep them happy, and then you'll get hold of the power. But he didn't do that. I told him, but that's why he's a great politician, because he's not a liar, he's not a hypocrite. And I quoted this, I told him, did you hear what he himself says? He himself says in Nahjul Balagha, Muawiyah is not a smarter politician than I am. Nor does he know a war better than I do. But Muawiyah practices hypocrisy. I don't. I'm an honest man. Because I fear Allah. I have fear of Allah. Therefore, people went against Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. Talha and Zubair rose to fight against him in a battle along with the wife of the Prophet, Umm al muminin Aisha. They all joined forces against Imam Ali, which resulted in the Battle of Jamal, and about 20,000 Muslims were killed in the battle. 20,000. Imam Ali won the battle, but then he forgave them all. He said, you go. Oh, everybody goes. That then resulted in another battle, the Battle of Safin against Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. A battle that lasted for almost one year, one year of war. So many Muslims got killed, including the Prophet's companion Ammar ibn Yasir. Ammar, the Prophet's companion. He was fighting next to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. And he got killed in that battle by the army of Muawiyah. Many people got killed. But, and that led to another war, the Battle of Nahrawan. People started cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib billah. Talking against him billah. Muawiyah started criticizing Imam Ali alayhi salam from the pulpits. He started using foul words against Imam Ali from the pulpits. Did that ever shake and shatter the self-esteem of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib? You think? No. Why? 
because he knows what he was doing was of the pleasure of Allah. It pleases Allah. This is what is right thing to do. I don't care what people say. And that's why I tell you brothers and sisters, please pay attention to this point. Some of the sisters, when I tell them, wear your hijab the way that Allah wants you to wear it, not the way that the fashion industry wants you to wear it. They tell me, Sheikh, you know, I, I want to wear you know, hijab the way that Calvin Klein designs Gucci, Banana, Gabbana, whatever, Anna, all these things. I want to wear the style because it's fashionable. I'd like to wear my hijab in a way where like my hair has become, you know, the leaning tower of Pisa or the Eiffel Tower or whatever towers out there. So that's how I like to wear my hijab because this is the fashion. I'd like to make my face, you know, all makeup, whatever, everything on the nails, whatever these things are. That's how I want to be because otherwise I'm not beautiful. And I tell them, why do you not have believe in yourself? You set the standards of beauty by following what Allah describes. Why can't we start wearing abayas, for example? Or the dresses that are loose, not tight. Most of our fuqaha and maraja say it is haram. It is forbidden for women to go out with visible makeup. It's haram, it's not allowed. Why do we have to wear tight jeans, tight pants, tight, you know, clothings? which reveal more than what they conceal so that we can remain in fashion. You set the fashion by following what Allah describes as haqq. What did Fatima to Zahra السلام, wear? What did Zainab السلام, wear? What did the families of Ahlul Bayt السلام, wear? That is what we need to wear. Today, what do the wives and daughters of our ulama, ulama, by ulama, I mean the scholars in Najaf, the scholars in Qom, the ulama that you see, the mujtahideen. How do you see their wives and their children coming out on the street? With tights? No. They wear the abayas. That's what we need to train ourselves and our children to wear. Even if people started criticizing us, it doesn't matter. What we do, we do because it's right, not because of what people think is right. That has resulted in what's called today, there is a big thing out there among academics. Sisters and brothers, you can look it up. It's called objectification. Self-objectification. What is self-objectification? Women are now treating themselves as objects because they're internalizing what people think of them and they want to make sure that they look like what people want them to look as opposed to what they want to look like. If you want papers, I can show you papers. In fact, one professor by the name of Dr. Shelley Grabe, Shelley Grabe, she writes in one paper that 50%, 50% of girls and undergraduate women in the United States suffer from physical and psychological and emotional problems because of the way the standard of the media of beauty, the media's portrayal of beauty. When these girls start looking at the media's portrayal of beauty, they look at themselves, they say, my gosh, I'm not beautiful. Even though Allah creates everyone beautiful. But I don't look like her. So I have to look like her. And they start believing that this is what the standard of beauty is because that's what they keep on seeing repeatedly on the internet, on television, in the movies, etc., etc., everywhere around them. This is what the standard of beauty is. And hence, they become self objectifying. They objectify, they treat themselves as objects. That's why there is a whole website that says no to objectification or something like that. No objectification. You know, it's fighting against this kind of standard. And this is something that's being discussed by professors, academics, and universities. We're not talking about some Muslims, non Muslims, and all that stuff. That's why I say, subhanAllah, the Qur'an in Surah Al-Ahzab, when the Qur'an talks about hijab, Allah tells the, the Prophet, say to your wives and the female believers to wear loose clothing, jalabi bihin, jilbab, jalabi bihin, 
ذلك أدنى أن يعرفنا فلا يؤذين That is best for them so that they don't become hurt Now some people say maybe it's the physical hurt They don't get attacked physically We say maybe that's part of it But we can expand it Not maybe not only physical hurt Could be the emotional hurt 50% of girls and undergraduate women in the United States are suffering I mean, I'm, I haven't done the statistics, but what numbers would that be? How many millions are we talking about here? 50% of the girls and undergraduate women in the United States. As young as age seven. Can you believe it? As young as age seven is when they start objectifying themselves. When they start feeling depressed. They start feeling having a low self-esteem. Why? Because they don't meet the media's standards of beauty what is set by the fashion industry out there. And then people ask, well, why did Allah mandate hijab? That's the reason Allah mandates hijab. One of the reasons, one of the reasons to protect, to protect society, to protect women themselves. People think that if I don't dress like what those guys dress, even the boys, even the boys, mashallah, you find them sometimes, you know, the other day I was praying, Someplace, I won't mention where. I was praying somewhere and then we were doing ruku'. You know, we go to ruku'. Whenever we go to ruku', I have to close my eyes. Because of the guys who are praying in front of me. If you know what I mean. And I'm thinking, what fashion is this? I mean, at least dress in a modest way. Boys and girls. <laughs> Both. We need to dress with modesty. Whatever pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now if people will say, well, Shaykh, so, so should I like, you know, walk out on the street looking, I don't know, like a monster or whatever, like, you know. But, uh, no, I, I didn't say that, you know. You, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that one day there will be some designers, you know, they'll come up with fashion. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say you have to wear this. But Allah gave the outline. The requirements. So what is hijab? First of all, the physical form of the hijab is for a lady, for example, to cover her whole body, head to toe, with the exception of the face and the hands up to the wrist. The clothing must be loose, not tight, so that they don't reveal her figure. And they should not be made up of colors like fluorescent pink, for example, or things that will shine and attract attention. They should be made of some modest colors. And they're not allowed to wear any visible makeup when they go outside. That's the hijab, the physical form of the hijab. If you wear that criteria, you're good. In addition to this, we have the social form of the hijab. Social form, which is very important to boys and girls, and even more to, so to the boys. How do you talk to the opposite gender? How do you interact with the opposite gender? You find people sometimes sitting down together in a shisha bag, mashallah, hijab and everything, you know, whatever. And they're smoking shisha together, they're laughing together, they're joking together, whatever. Eid is tomorrow. Ha 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 ha. That is not allowed. Here we talk about the social form of the hijab. That's why Allah, when he begins talking about hijab in Surah An-Nur, he talks to men first. Say to the male believers to lower their gazes. What does lower their gazes? It means they walk like this? No, of course not. You know, you'll bump your head in a wall or tree or something, you know. It means that you don't look at the haram. When you talk, you talk with respect. Fatima al-Zahra, alayhi salam, used to speak to strangers, but within the boundaries of the sharia. Do you guys read Hadith Al-Kisa? You read Hadith Al-Kisa? Do you guys even know what Hadith Al-Kisa is? Okay, good, Alhamdulillah. Hadith Al-Kisa. Who narrates Hadith Al-Kisa? Do you guys read? Who, who narrates it usually? What's the first sentence that we usually find? An who? An Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari an man? An Fatima, salamullahi alayha. From Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari, the Prophet's companion, narrating from who? Fatima al-Zahra. So who told Jabir about the hadith of Kisa? Who told him? Fatima alayhi salam. But she, did she sit down with him and joked with him and laughed with him and smoked shisha with him and taught him? Of course not. Well, billah. 
while wearing her hijab, while having her dignity, speaking respectfully, professionally, teaching him the event of the hijab, of the kisa. That's the way we need to interact. This is something important. Now, people tell me, Sheikh, well, I work at a place where I have co-workers, colleagues. What do you want me to do? No problems. As long as the conversation is, you know, professional, within the professional realm, that's fine. There's no problem with you having a conversation with strangers, with your co-workers, with your colleagues. If you go to university or you have a project that at work that you are, you know, you have three, four ladies and two, three, four men, for example, you're working together on a project, on an assignment. You, know, you interact within the boundaries of the assignment, you know, whatever the assignment dictates, you have to work together, cooperate together, collaborate together within the boundaries of the Sharia, as long as you don't cross the red lines. That's no problem at all. That is what's called the social hijab, which is important. So if people criticize us, that should not lower my self-esteem. My self-esteem comes from the belief in Allah and my faith in Allah. So that's where I beg to differ from mass law. Yes, everybody likes to be complimented. We all are human beings at the end of the day. So we like the compliments. But if I see people turning against me because what I said was the haq, the truth, like Imam Ali, people turn against him because what he did was the haq and the truth, then I don't have to worry about it. What I have to worry is about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tomorrow I'm going to have to answer to him. So even if the whole world isolates me, if I'm right, khalas, I don't care. I'm right. If I, as long as I know I'm right, not that I think I know, <laughs> that's a problem. As long as I consult, I follow the lines, the guidelines of the Sharia, ah, and I know these are the right things to do, these are the right steps, this is what we need to do. Moving on, Maslow says, if you have the physiological needs, if you have the security, the love and the family, you know, the, that relationships, the, the belonging, then you have the self-esteem, the respect. Finally, you can reach the pinnacle of the pyramid, and that's what he calls self-actualization. Self-actualization. What is self-actualization? It's when you can really unleash your true potential. You discover what you're good at, and you actually do well at it. So if you're good at painting, for example, you can really start drawing the best of the arts. If you're good at literature, you can write the best of poetry the best of novels, you can win prizes, prizes. If you are good at science, you become one of the best, and so on and so forth. So that's what he discusses. These are things which are important that according to mass law they required. This really leaves me with one last thing. Whenever we see people trying, we need to support them. We need to help them out. If you see some, somebody, for example, who's young and they're trying something and they fail, don't go and hammer them on the head. Like, ah, you just failed, you're a failure, you're not, not gonna succeed in anything. You know what, you tried once, it's okay. Maybe you can try a second time. Learn from your mistakes. Do you guys know who Thomas Edison was? Yeah, what did he do? What's, what what's, is he famous for? He did a lot of things. What, what, did he, what is he famous for? The light bulb. Thomas Edison says, if quitters would only know how close they are to accomplishing their goals, they would not have quit. When he was discovering or inventing the light bulb, of course, Thomas Edison was a wealthy man. He was a wealthy man. And he did not do it qurbatan illallah ta'ala. He knew this thing will make lots of money. So, so he was after the financial gains. But nonetheless, he was a wealthy man, so he hired a lot of people. He hired people, and their job was, they were given what we call the periodic table. You guys know the periodic table of the elements? He gave them the periodic table of the elements. He said, there, you try any solid, any solid that you see on the periodic table, try to make a filament out of it, and use it in the light bulb. See if it works. So they tried iron, it burnt, did not work. Zinc, did not work. Copper, didn't work. Gold, didn't work until they hit the bullseye, as they say. And what was it? What is it? Tungsten, exactly. Here we have another biochemist. Although that's pretty good, you know. Even though they're biochemists, but they know stuff, you know, because they have the word chemist attached to them. You know, that's why it's chemists who are really important. So, tungsten succeeded. 
So after all these failures, they had a success. But that success was a huge success. It made him a fortune. Even though he was quite a fortunate man himself, it became even more fortunate. So people need to try. You fail, that's fine. You keep on trying until you succeed. But always try to do your best, put your effort in, be patient, and inshallah, you will succeed. Last thing I'll leave you with, of course, ask people for advice. These people of the Qarnayn, when they did not know what to do, they asked for help. Ask the experts for their advice. Don't ask people who themselves don't have a clue about what they're talking about for advice. That's where we have a lot of problems. Especially when it comes to religion, mashallah. Everyone becomes a faqih and a alim and a magja taqlid. Why do you do wudu this way? Well, you know, I asked so and so. He told me this is how to do wudu. Well, does he know? I mean, has he been in the hausa? Has he studied religion? No, well, he just, you know, he's a good man and he told me, you know. When is Eid? Oh, tomorrow is Eid. Khalas, for shuk. Tomorrow is Eid. That's it. We're done. Well, have they made an announcement? No, it doesn't matter. Tomorrow is Eid. Khalas. You know. well, have you seen the moon? No, no, Crescent. It doesn't matter. I saw it in my dreams. You know. If you don't know, don't say anything. Ask people who know. Those who have the expertise, just like, just like when you become ill and you go to a doctor, if the physician you meet tells you, um, I studied, phys you know, I became a physician online. I went online, Dr. Google was my supervisor and was my teacher. So that's how I achieved my degree, through Dr. Google. You know. Would you want to be treated by such a person? So ask people who have exper expert experience. And same thing, what surprises me sometimes, especially the youngsters here, the youngsters, people who are teenagers sometimes. Teenagers sometimes when they need advice, instead of asking their parents for help, they go ask their friends. I I'm not you know, putting down anybody here, but your friends, no matter how good they are, they may be really good people, but they don't have experience in life as much as your parents do, as much as some elders do. So you find sometimes they might give you an advice which is the wrong advice. Well, say, but she's my friend. He's my friend. I know. Maybe in his opinion, he's trying to help you, but because of their lack of experience, they fail you. They tell you, do this, do that. When you have a problem, go run to the people who love you the most, and they're your parents. Or go run to individuals who have a reputation in the community, some reputable religious scholars, some people who have a reputation for their wisdom in the community, people respect them. Go seek their advice. People who have the wisdom to help you. People who fear Allah. That's something important. And that's why you find these people asking Dhul Qagnain for help. He's the expert. Help us. So that's another important lesson we need to learn. When you have a problem, ask the expert who knows what he or she is talking about, who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who fears the akhirah, and who cares about you the most. Ask those people. I'm not saying you don't need to talk to your friend you know, stop, like, you know, shut them off, block them now, put them all blocks, blocks, blocks. That's what I'm, what I'm saying right now. What I'm saying is that in serious matters, you need to consult people who have the experience, the expertise, and no one is better than your own parents or the reputable religious scholars, those who have a good reputation among the community, to be wise, to be God-fearing. Those are the individuals you need to seek for help so that they can provide you with the best assistance. This leaves us, insha'Allah, now with one last lecture, which is tomorrow night, insha'Allah, about...